Well, hello. Thank you for coming out. I'm Mark Bikert, executive editor of Backstage, and with me is the Emmy nominee, Matt Bomer, for The Normal Heart. Congratulations. You're having you. an amazing year. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate your time and for being here. So. Now, you've talked about how The Normal Heart has changed your life when you were a teenager growing up uh, in Houston. What is it like to be Emmy nominated for a project that changed your life? Um, it's just a combination of so many, uh, so much synchronicity that I feel like was just due to a higher spiritual power or something. And the fact that I encountered this play at such a young age and then I would have been happy doing this play at a regional theater, you know, and the fact that I got to do it for HBO on television and to tell it in such a vivid new way, given the medium of film, was just that in and of itself was a dream come true. And so um, then to have that recognized by your peers, it's just, I'm kind of still waiting to wake up, I guess. I'm kind of still waiting for the other ball to drop or something. I don't know. It's just great. And you really fought for this role, right? You did a lot of prep and you did a lot of research to sell yourself to Ryan Murphy. Yeah, it was a long, I think the first time I met him, when I found out they were making it into a film, I, I immediately begged my representation to get me a meeting. And I didn't have any role in mind at the time. I would have been happy to have played any part in this film. And um, as I sat with Ryan, conversations steered more towards Felix. And so we had began that dialogue in about September of 2011. And at the time, it was an independent film. And... Uh, or a low-budget film, I'm not really sure. I'm not really privy to that information. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> and uh, so then I started just researching the role as we continue the dialogue. And I mean, I did everything from, I mean, I, went, I flew to Tulsa to see what his hometown was like and spend time there. To, I, I spoke with some of the original um, doctors who started, began the research on AIDS uh, back in the early 80s. And, uh, read books and watched documentaries, and we just kept a running dialogue going. And and I guess I just hoped that, you know, at the end of the day, I'd get a chance to play the role. And thankfully, it all worked out. What did you do when you found out that you got the role? I was really terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all were. I mean, I remember the first scene we shot. Uh, I don't know if everyone here has seen the film or not. I, I imagine you have, but. I, um, thank you. But I, the, the first scene, we, we actually sh filmed it somewhat sequentially. The first scene we shot was uh, at the New York Times with Mark and I. And Mark and I had met briefly once or twice, and we'd done one brief rehearsal, uh, during which he was very kind and available, as he is. He's an amazing man and an amazing artist. Uh, and he turned to me right before they called action in the first take. He goes, are you scared? <laughs> and I went, yeah, are you? And he goes, I am scared shitless. <laughs> and, and, um, but I think we, you know, found comfort in each other and, and uh, we both knew we had done a lot of work and, and we just trusted that. And the world that Ryan created for this film, it was unlike anything I've ever seen. And I've done, you know, sci-fi things and, and lo-fi sci-fi and all that, but getting to the set, uh, you were immediately transported into this time period. And having done that much research on uh, that time period, it just brought you right into it. And Ryan was so prepared that, you know, we just immediately after that first day, after we expressed that fear, I uh, just started to feel more and more comfortable. Um, and by the end of that first day, we thought, okay, this, is, this could be really uh, a profound experience. Do you normally do that much research before a role? I do. I, you know, it, it's so interesting as an actor, as I'm sure you all know, you know, it's like some roles you do that much work on and no one ever sees it. <laughs> <laughs> or if they do, they're like, oh, cool. Um, <clears throat> so much of it boils down to the writing, really, and the story. And... I feel like this story had been marinating for me for 20 years by the time I did the first take. I mean, I read the play when I was 14, and it had always been 
so integral to my understanding of empathy and survival and compassion and unconditional love. And um, so I think having, having had, had it be such a special part of my life for so long, I felt a really profound responsibility um, to cover every base and then some. Like, I don't really know how much going to Tulsa, Oklahoma <laughs> came across in my performance in the film. I totally got but that. But I just wanted to do everything, you know. I wanted, I wanted no stone unturned that so, so that at the end of the day, no matter what, I could say I gave it 150% because that's how strongly I felt about the story. But what is there to do in Tulsa? <laughs> is anyone here from Tulsa? <laughs> it's actually... <laughs> there are a lot of freeways. Um, How long did you stay in Tulsa? I stayed in Tulsa two and a half days. Yeah, which was all I needed. I kind of... <laughs> I spent a lot of time in West Tulsa, actually, which is really fascinating, actually. If you're ever in Oklahoma, it's worth driving through just to see a very distinct piece of Americana and a very just, you know, unique um, environment for people to grow up in. But that's so key to Felix, because that's what he has left behind. That's right. That's why I wanted to see it, because for me, one of the most profound things that t says so much about who he is is the fact that he's someone who came from there and is now writing about style for the New York Times. And that's lowercase a to double Z for me. Um, so I wanted to see what that was to know what he left behind and what motivated him and what pushed him to, to um, what made him so ambitious. Well, when you're doing a piece like this that's a period piece and that everyone has a personal connection to, are you checking in with Ryan Murphy and with your fellow castmates as you're doing research? Yes and no. I, th I You know, Ryan had done so much research himself. Um, and leading up to filming, he's really the only person who I had contact with. Mark and I met. Um, we'd met sort of briefly at... at events here and there, but we didn't really meet until about a week before filming at a rehearsal in Ryan's hotel room. Um, so Ryan and I would touch base, he would say, have you seen this documentary? And I'd say, yeah, have you read this book? Or, you know, we'd pass along information. But, you know, Ryan is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. I mean, it's, it's almost unfair. I've seen him have conversations with several creative minds, all of whom are highly intelligent people, and he's three steps ahead. And he's not just three steps ahead intellectually, he's three steps ahead thematically and holistically. It's really amazing to watch. So um, I don't know how much of my information he took in or not, but um, I was doing it and passing it along. What were the rehearsals like? Did you have a lot of rehearsal time, or was it just grab what you can? No, um, uh, we got together and um, Mark and I rehearsed the New York Times scene together. And uh, I think that was an important one to rehearse ahead of time, um, just to kind of feel out each other's rhythm and cadence and what they were bringing. And um, that was the only rehearsal we ever did. And uh, Mark and I both kind of started in the theater where you have a lot of rehearsal. And uh, so we kind of just knew to stay you know, we weren't holding hands in between takes, but we, we just related to each other in character pretty much the entire shoot. And was so, it hard? So that when the cameras, you know, we'd talk to each other in character or have a conversation that Ned and Felix might have had that day or, you know, talk about other characters in the piece or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, have a little moment before of whatever scene we were filming. And... Um, I think that helped us not have to suddenly manufacture something when the cameras were rolling. We were already sort of in the middle of something when they called action. Is that typically your process, to kind of stay within the character in between takes? Or is this just the normal heart? This is the first film that I tried that on um, because it was, you know so important and because we didn't have a lot of rehearsal and some sets you know you you kind of have to adapt set to set but this is one of the sets that really allowed for it and really 
um, gave the actors the room to do that if they so chose. And uh, so um, I really wanted to take advantage of that. So you're not doing an elaborate jewel heist on your downtime on white collar? <laughs> <laughs> to try to do anything I did on white collar. I can pick a lock. Um, yeah, no, I <laughs> don't. Although Tim and I, you know, we typically try to keep a fun banter between us in between. And I think there were times when you're living as a character more than you are yourself, as you do when you're filming a series. You know, I, I think I worked 80 hours last week or something as the character and, you know, I had my six hours to sleep as me. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I think there are times when what that character is going through bleeds into your life and can bleed into how you relate to others on in between takes as well. But this was the first job that I really wanted to just stay in it the whole time because I would have been so happy to play this role eight times a week for six months, and I just wanted to get every moment out of it, you know. I mean, does that make it hard to leave Felix behind? What, what did it do to you just emotionally? Well, I did a lot. Of, it was very difficult to leave behind for a lot of reasons. I mean, first and foremost, just physically being, you know, 130 pounds when I finished the movie and, you know, incredibly weak and, and my hormones were all out of balance and I, I was just in a completely different mindset. Um, and that took a good deal of time to get back to what I felt like was me again. Um, and that's not, it wasn't like an actor thing because I have kids, I wanted to be, I wanted that American thing of being like, okay, I've given it a week. I wanna go back to me now. <laughs> and it just was not happening. Um, and. You know, there were so many parts of him outside of just the physical nature of things and getting back to um, how I wanted to feel again. Um, there were parts of him that I didn't want to leave behind. I feel like he found so much, what I wanted for him was to have so much nobility and courage and, and um, unconditional love in the midst of these horrific circumstances. And um, that's something I wanted to bring into my life as well. You know, I mean, not under horrific circumstances necessarily, but <laughs> just that type of uh, looking at the world and, and making the most of, of, of what you have when you have it. Other than going to Tulsa, what was, yeah. the, what was the biggest piece of the research that you used on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, it, really, honestly, it was different scene to scene. I also spent time, I, I was very lucky to have some of the old guard let me spend a couple of days with them at the style section of the New York Times. And um, I started with Jacob Bernstein, who works there now. Um, and that was really helpful, but he wasn't there during the late 70s and early 80s, so he kind of gave me access and entree into some of the people who'd been there um, since that time. And they just illuminated me as to what the climate was at the New York Times and what the rhythms were and what the day-to-day -day life was, so that when Mark arrives at my desk, I know what I'm doing at that time, what he interrupts and where I'd be going and where I'd be coming from. And um, so there's that scene and then, you know, the specifics. I created this entire like borderline PowerPoint presentation uh, for um, Ryan as to how the illness was going to progress and, and, and what was going to happen when. And, you know, we ran those ideas by each other and he thought he would say, oh yeah, great, but maybe not that yet. And then here we'll do this. And so my time spent with doctors was very helpful there just in creating that physical reality. And, um, you know, the stuff with Mark was just a matter of, um, of the work we brought to the table and trying to be present with each other over the course of the day. How did you navigate the, the pressure of doing this? Because it means so much to so many people, and yourself especially. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> you know, I, that's a really good question. I think I really felt the pressure really, I mean, more than I've ever felt on any job I've ever had. And um, I think it was, it was, really getting to me about two weeks before filming and then I just asked I just asked to get out of my own way and tell a story that was like yeah, just so much bigger than me and 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 do it with um integrity and I think once I invoked whatever that was it something just 
took over once we started filming and, and that pressure I felt went away uh, to a certain extent. I mean, it was always there. I'm glad it was always there to some extent, but you know, the not sleeping at night went away, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> and then once we got past the love scene, that <laughs> also helped me sleep better at night too. Did that, did that pressure sharpen your performance though? I think, you know, having had the material, uh, you know, for almost two years by the time we started filming, I had so much time to rehearse. I rented out a theater space in LA. It was a stage. I mean, it wasn't quite, it wasn't nice like this. It was like $15 an hour. And I used to go up on the stage every day this summer before we started the film and, and act out my scenes and walk around on the stage and, and try to create a physical life and do all these crazy things that if anybody had walked in on me, they would have thought I was insane. But again, I think because I was able to have the time to do all these things and, and you know, talk to doctors and go to Tulsa and watch and read and, and spend time in a theater doing the play by myself. <laughs> um, it, it, it helped ease some of that, you know. Um, but yeah, it certainly sharpened it then. That's what motivated me to do all those things. So, yeah. I hope you showed up to set and said, well, this is how I did it alone when I was running through yeah, the entire play. Uh, oh, I like that choice. Not what I did by myself. Um, <laughs> You might want to try this, Mark. I, uh, just saying. Uh, no, there is something. I tried to do it loosely enough that I wasn't like locking into anything that would be completely ignoring Mark or any of my co-stars as the scenes were going on. Well, that, that feeling of embracing that pressure, was that communal among the cast? Was that, were you all oh, having yeah. that same? Yeah. I, I mean, I know that Mark and I were. Um, and that's who I spent most of my time with. Um, I didn't have a di I never had a dialogue with Julia about it, but I, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you can talk about it as pressure or you can talk about it as responsibility, you know, because it's, it's rare as actors that you're, you're given the opportunity to tell, I mean, this, this play was written from ground zero of this disease from direct experience. And so it's, it's very rare as an actor that you are given the opportunity to create that ra reality or recreate that reality. And I think everybody came to this piece because they were affected by it in some way. I had lost people, I think everyone else in the cast had at some point, and um, we all wanted to tell the story and, and, and give everything we had to the story. And I. So it was pressure, but it was more, um, for me at least, it was a responsibility I felt to, you know, people we lost. How did you approach the, your death scene? Because that's the toughest thing to play without doing the Greta Garbo as Camille, the very <laughs> slight shudder and yeah. head to one side. <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh, you know, that, I came, at that point, I really, was so, I had so little energy that it was like, I would be sitting in a chair and I'd be like, oh, I know I have to get up to go to the bathroom, but I don't know, like, maybe I'll just sit here like another 10 minutes. You know, it was like, I didn't have a lot in my tanks. And so I was just kind of sitting there and as soon as they were like just starting to dress the scene, I just went out and got into the hospital um, bed and lay there and, um, I think we'd all done the work, so we just hoped that the work took over, you know? We hoped that, um, we, like I said, we could just get out of our way and, let, and, and try to channel something and not, you know, be thinking about what tactic we're playing or what our objective is, but just to really let something come through us. And we had so much help, uh, just given the, the climate on the set at the time and the hair and makeup people and, um, you know, the, even the whole atmosphere on the set was, was, it was the quietest set I've ever been on. And, um, you know, and they just call action and... When you were it. so tired, you just fell asleep. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we started on my close-up, so <laughs> I definitely didn't fall asleep. I was awake. Um, but yeah, it was, it was delicate and, and everyone was just, God, we, we'd been together for a while there, so everybody just kind of, I felt the support. I didn't, you know, 
for me, if you'd ever told me that I'd be in a scene with Julia Roberts and not, you know, think it was a big deal that I was in a scene with Julia Roberts, I would have been like, yeah. That I've, but everybody, we'd lived together as these characters for a while. It was one of the last things we shot. So, um, you know, um, they started on the close-up, and Ryan was so, so intelligent and so gentle with his direction and so um, thoughtful with his direction and... Um, just little nuances he would give and, and, you know, come out and just whisper them into your ear and then go away and then roll camera again. And um, it was just the ideal environment to have to do a scene like that. Do you get that kind of direction a lot? Just the, the whispered notes? <laughs> you mean on other jobs? Well, is it typical? <laughs> um, it, dep- it just varies director to director, you know? I film is such a director's medium, so they, they run the show, man. It's... It's not the actor show. Um, so some of them like to yell at you <laughs> or, or scream at you. Some of them will come and whisper in your ear and be very sensitive to what's going on in the scene. Some of them aren't. They want to know what the shot looks like and, and you know how it's set up and what's the axis going to be. And It just depends. Um, I just feel like Ryan really was the perfect director for this piece because it meant so much to him. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it wasn't like, uh, you know, n- not that there aren't amazing action movies that have great meaning to the directors, but this had great personal meaning to him, and I think he felt the responsibility as well. So um, he was only there to help us. Um, it was not about his ego. It was about, um, you know, helping us get to where we needed to be and, and tell the story. And he was so intuitive. His intuition is amazing. I, you know, he's cast all these huge shows. A lot of times, I had never done anything like this that would tell him I could play this role. Um, and he, he saw something in me that he thought could do it. And, and he, it's the same thing when you're working with him in the scene. He's so, he has very strong ideas, but he's so present in the moment. And he doesn't just stick to what he wants. If he sees you do something, that he goes, wow, oh, he's, he's there for that, and he, he goes with that. And sometimes he takes it back down to the studs and goes, okay, let's <laughs> do this, you know, and that's my favorite kind of director to work with. You know? But you also had to get Larry Kramer's seal of approval too, right? Yeah. And you met with him and... Yeah, I came to, uh, I mean, I'd, you know, he'd obviously been a big figure in my life for years, but um, I came to a play reading of his, and... I said hi to him, and um, then I came over to his apartment, and uh, I brought him cupcakes, because I knew he had a sweet tooth, (laughs) and uh, we talked, and at the time, I'd already had about a year um, of research, maybe over a year, with Felix, and um, we just talked about the piece, and and, and, um, I asked him, you know, the greatest thing he did for me was to really consolidate um, my process because it was like, hey, Larry. And he's like, yeah, uh, that's great. So here's what you need to do. <laughs> here's what you should focus on. And he was right. And, um, and uh, he, so he helped me consolidate that. And we just kind of hit it off, and, and, and having him around for this was just so cool. It was so trippy for me to be doing this and having him there and be doing scenes with Mark, who was just channeling him while he's at Video Village. It was, and um, we did that April Showers benefit scene um, the day that Doma was overturned, which was such a huge day in, in, in so many ways. Larry is you know, partly responsible for that day happening. Um, And so to have him there and to get to share all these moments, it was just, it was one of those times when you just felt like, oh, we're we're doing, we're in the right place at the right time. We're we're getting the signs from the universe, whatever you want to call it, that we're we're doing the right thing. What was it like on set that day? It was completely celebratory. you know, there were so many people there, and, the, and it was the day the gay men's uh, chorus was, um, I almost said the gay men's health chorus. 
That's how deeply entrenched in the world of normal heart I still am. Uh, the game in scores uh, were there and singing. It was just like, I mean, it was just one of those days you never wanted to end. And um, it was magical. And, and I'm just so glad we got to start out at a dance party because I was so excited. I was like, this is the most I've wanted to ever dance on film. So um, it was just great. It was cool. And getting to have that dance where Mark and I's characters are kind of getting to have the prom they never had. And it was just, you know, amazing. And then just to go back to you being so tired from getting down to 130 pounds, what is, how do you navigate your own personal life when you're this immersed in a character? How do you protect yourself? I wasn't really interested in protecting myself so much as I was... Um, you know, my kids and my husband and people who love me and care about me and <laughs> were very worried that I wasn't going to make it through the shoot. But I, um, you know, I think, I feel like I did it in a pretty responsible way. And then um, I think the last month or three weeks to a month before filming, I left them because um, at that point I was starting to get, you know, my face was starting to sink in and stuff and I didn't want the kids to see that. And um, although they were so resilient about the whole thing. Uh, they, I, I feel like I kind of prepared them as best as you can prepare a kid. But I think, you know, kids' imaginations are so much greater than ours. I think they thought that I was going to be, you know, like flat as a piece of paper when I told them I was going to be skinny. So even when I weighed 130 pounds, they were like, you're not that skinny. I was like, <laughs> really? Thanks. Um, so it was really more about protecting them. And then, and then when I was... Um, and here in New York, away from them for that month leading up to filming, it was, it was very monastic. I mean, my day consisted of getting up, preparing whatever 300 calories I was going to eat for that day, and then, you know, walking around, walking with my cane, you know, doing laps around the block, smoking cigarettes, I'm not proud to say, because I needed something to pretend like I was eating. Um, I have since quit, thankfully, but um, it, was just, it was just me kind of by myself doing my thing and, and working on the material, and then, and then we were filming. Did you ever take any time to like just zone out and watch TV and leave behind the normal heart, or were you just in it? Can I tell you what's crazy? I, the whole time we were filming this movie, I was like, I'm not watching Philadelphia. I'm not rewatching Philadelphia. <laughs> it's too great. It's amazing on its own. I don't want to steal any of that stuff. I'm leaving it alone. And I wasn't watching TV. I was doing a lot of reading. I was actually doing a lot of meditating because, I, you know, I, when you don't have any energy, that's a really fun thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, so I was doing that. And I finally, I was like, you know what? I'm going to flip on the TV. And um, my place in, in New York has, was it called TiVo? It has TiVo. So it's like this old school thing. It only got like six channels. for. I don't know how to work this thing. And I flip it on, and freaking Philadelphia is on TV. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? I'm like, in this existence of living as this character, I'm like, I think I want five minutes to escape from this world. Bam, Philadelphia. <laughs> Did you have the energy to turn it off? No. <laughs> I was like, fuck it, I'm watching it now. <laughs> okay, I get it. I'm watching it. I clearly need to steal something. Let's go. <laughs> and I did, and I did. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, no, but I did watch it through, and I'm, I'm really glad that I did. Well, I mean, were you, what is, what is it like to see the movie so embraced? both by audiences and critics, and also the slew of Emmy Awards that it garnered? You know, I think the most meaningful thing to me, honestly, were, were when people would come up to me at screenings we had, or, or want to talk, not even just to me, at, after screenings, um, and, and talk about people they lost, or, or something we had depicted that reminded them of an experience they had, or um, something they'd gone through or that helped them in some way, or people would come up to me on the streets and show me pictures of, of um, lovers they'd lost or, or, or their Felix. And to me, that was just the most amazing thing to experience as an actor. I mean, you know. 
is that going to be the, something that you're going to look for in every job now? <laughs> um, you know, I, it, it was so hard. It was so hard to go back to work after this job because it's just, you know, I think if you're lucky as an actor, you get like one or two of these in a career. And eventually you have to buckle down and go, oh, God, I, I have to go back to work. And here I am on white collar, you know, um, I think I was like rappelling off the side of a building with my silk tie. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I'm just switching gears here. Um, and I was so, I was so childish about it. I was like, no, I'm not going back. I only want to do no more heart forever. And, uh, <laughs> and then there I was and uh, had to do it. So, um, look, I, 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 I have some things that I, I'm contracted to that I, I, I'm finishing up. And after that, I, man, I really hope that I'm provided the means to just really make decisions about jobs that, uh, that are like the normal heart on some level, that, that have some kind of profound meaning to you. And I've tried to do that as much as I can. I mean, there are some jobs you have to take and you have to be able to, you know, support your kids and everything else. Um, but I, I really, I think for me to have done this job and to have been a part of this job and then just to take any, anything that came my way because it was m monetarily interesting or whatever, I can't do that. I, I think I have to, um, after I finish Magic Mike XXL. <laughs> I, I was going to go there, but it seemed an awkward um, segue. I'm going to then hopefully, you know, make decisions that are, that are, <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, look, I, first of all, that, who doesn't want to work with Steven Soderbergh and, and th that incredible group of actors and get to have that bond with them? And, and, you know, I feel like that was just trial by fire, man. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I do want to make... Um, Choices, hopefully, that are that are personal to me and that mean something in that way. Well, before Magic Mike XXL, you just wrapped white collar. So, are you taking so much deserved time off? I, I just wrapped white collar like um, today, right? About three hours ago. <laughs> which is why I'm a little emotional. <laughs> um, six years with the same people. Which is, you know, we're gypsies, so to have had that family for so long was just, man, it was such a blessing, and it was just one of those sets that was so fun and relaxed and creative, and, and um, I will definitely miss it. I think I have, I think I have about a month off before um, other things, so, yeah. Well, having six seasons of White Collar, was that, did you appreciate that more? Because you've had a couple of series that didn't, last long. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I thought that was very politely phrased. <laughs> no, that was beyond politely phrased. No, I think, um, I, I, yeah, I, I feel like that was one of the things that made that experience so special is that we had all kicked around TV a bit. Um, and so we knew that we had something really special and, and we valued that and we knew not to be the douche who was like hanging out in his trailer while everybody else was waiting for them on set. You know, we, we respected what we had and I think that's a big part of what made it such a familial environment and why, you know, most of our crew stuck around for six years, which is really a rarity. Well, I feel like in that situation, you know to enjoy it more. Yeah, yeah, you definitely have a sense of gratitude about everything, almost to a fault. Because I remember being like, wait, are you sure things last pet longer than two seasons? <laughs> are you sure? Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think if you'd ever told me that I would be on anything that lasted that long, I would have laughed really hard, so. How did, the, how did White Collar come about for you? Was it an audition? It was several auditions and then two screen tests oh, wow. because they had wanted to hire a Brit in his 40s. And I was 29 or had just turned 30 and am not British. <laughs> <laughs> so I really had to fight uphill on that one. And thankfully, Jeff Easton, the creator, um, he really stood by me. He really stood by me and, and believed in me and saw something in me 
that he felt was really right for the role. And, um, and I think eventually he just wore down the brass. They were like, fine, God, if you're still going to stand by this guy, we'll hire him. And then uh, thankfully it all worked out. What were the auditions, and how did you prepare for those, knowing what they wanted? Um, well, I worked on my British accent. <laughs> and I, no, I, I just, I tried to, you know, as an actor, you have your toolbox. You have what you can bring to the role. I didn't want to try to impose something on it that was not, you know, authentic to my imagination or my creativity. So Jeff and I would just rap on the phone and be like, would it be funny if we did that there? And he's, he's always been so collaborative that um, he'd give me ideas and I'd bounce ideas off him. And then by the time we got into the room for the screen test, it was just all, it was all fun. Were you hesitant to go in for that first audition looking at the breakdown of a British 40-year-old? I didn't know this at the time. Oh. No, I didn't know this. I didn't know this until I screen tested the first time and they were like, oh, hold on a second, they really want a British 40-year-old or whatever it was, and uh, so I was like, oh, great. Um, but you know, we just, keep, you know, we do what actors do, we keep our head down, we try to do the best work we can, and so much of that stuff is out of our control, you know, we just, all we're responsible for is the work we bring to the table on any given day, and I kept trying to dig a little deeper and, and bring new things to the character so that if I did get to test again, at least they would see that I dug a little deeper, and um, I guess that was my process. Does that give you Confidence knowing that you were able to no. share. <laughs> <laughs> knowing that good work will rise to the top. You know, there's that great quote by, uh, I think it's by Twyla Tharp, actually, isn't it? Work begets work, life begets life. Um, and I always had that. I'm such a like, drama nerd. I always had that <laughs> at the front of my journal to remind myself to always work really hard and always bring everything I can to the table so that I can walk away saying I did everything I could. And then, you know, but also to remember to live life because that's, as artists, that's a big part of our work is to pay attention to life and live life. Well, so you have Twyla Tharp as inspiration and you flew to Tulsa for research. <laughs> Are you going to a stripper's convention for Magic Mike XXL? I, I don't think I'm going to make the convention. Um, I did go to a club, though, before the first one, of course, and I, and I hung out backstage. Um, I'm not going to say extensively, but <laughs> enough to, you know, I mean, so much of what I was responsible for in the first one was just sort of that Altman-esque um, one scene's going on in the background while another's going on in the foreground and, you know, camera left and camera right and those little bits of behavior that are going on uh, behind the scenes when you see Mike go from being on stage to being backstage and so I spent a good deal of time with those guys who are really amazing guys actually um, and just seeing kind of how they behave and what they do and trying to, trying to be peripheral enough and, and spend enough time with them that they kind of forgot that I was there taking notes, you know. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really amazing in their backgrounds and the ones who really love it and the ones who have other ambitions, it was really fascinating to see. One of them used to be a Power Ranger oh, wow. that I studied with and he incorporated that into his routine. <laughs> There were several like fancy roundhouse kicks in that routine. I'm not sure how well that went over with the ladies, but I was like, cool, man. You are you working with what you got. Were you devastated when your routine got cut from the final movie? Um, I think everybody's did for the more more or less. You know, it was sort of they were all kind of condensed into these montages. And um I, you know, look, when you work with somebody like Steven, um, you throw caution to the wind, I, you know, and you trust them implicitly. I, I think the first time I went to that movie, I was like standing up and having fun as Channing was dancing at the end. You know, I wasn't really thinking about, oh no, half of my Ken doll number isn't there, <laughs> man. Um, and they had been very candid with us about that at the beginning. They were like, look, we're going to choreograph the whole thing, which I had a blast doing, and we'll use the pieces of it that are cool, and we won't use the parts that aren't. They're, they don't fit into the montage or whatever. So I think, you know, you just trust the editing process and you trust your director. And sometimes that means all oh, your Ken doll routine makes it and sometimes it means it doesn't. <laughs> well, after Magic Mike XXL, you have, what's going on with the Montgomery Clift biopic? Um, 
That's, um, oh man, that would just be a dream, man. I, it's in the right hands, but to me, if I don't make that with the exact group of creatives that I want to make it with, I just don't want to do it at all because he is just so holy to me. And um, Liz Taylor, who's a big part of the, the film as well, I mean, it's almost a two-hander, um, is, you know, you know, was so kind to me and, and is so holy to me. And um, I just don't have any interest in doing, you know, we could film some, you know, sort of lower budget version of it tomorrow and air it and have it come and go and be some salacious thing. And that's just not what I'm interested in doing. So if, if the right people, if that all comes together the way it needs to, then we'll do it. And if not, then I will, um, treasure all the amazing memories I have of Monty having done all the research I've done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other actors inspire you other than Montgomery Clift? Oh my God, I mean, the, the list is endless. I mean, do you have a genre? Do you have a <laughs> American, foreign? Um, I remember, I mean, there are just so many iconic actors to me, but I remember, I think maybe because of the subtitles or something, the first time I went and saw foreign films, I was so blown away because I think you're just innately watching someone's behavior so much more. Um, so seeing like Marcello Mastroianni, and um, I know he hasn't always been the most PC individual, but Alain Delon, um, and people like that, and um, you know, the Americans, you know, the first time you see, you know, all those, all those Stella Adler actors, um, you know, it completely changes everything for you when you're watching Marlon Brando and, you know, he's doing something that's so fascinating and new and present and, um, you know, you think he's mumbling, but you understand every word he says. And um, so all that new school of Americans, and there are so many exciting actors out there today I feel. Um, I think Michael Fassbender is choosing really interesting projects, and um, I love I, I love watching Brad Pitt. I think he's amazing and has ch done such a great job straddling the studio world and really interesting indies. I mean, um, the, the Jesse James film he made is like one of my favorite films of the past decade. Was there a moment? Was there a, a performance or a movie that made you think growing up like, oh, that's what I want to do? Imitation of life. I, <laughs> Lana um, Turner or Claudia Colbert? I, you know, I, this is so nerdy. I, like, I don't even know if I should talk about this, but what the hell. I just referenced Claudia Colbert. Uh, Go for it. Um, it's not Claudette. It's, um, <laughs> it goes back a little before that. No, I think movies were the first time, um, you know, I had a wild imagination as a kid. Wild. And I was outside all the time swinging around in trees by myself and I would sit on a swing set and literally swing for like two hours and just like imagine things and what if this movie happened and then what if I was this guy and that was and so then when I saw movies um we didn't get to see a lot of movies in my house growing up so the first time I got to go to the movies I think was E.T. and um I just I thought oh my god it's, it just completely I was like somebody else gets my imagination and um, so I, then I would, I would watch movies and I would kind of inhabit those characters. Like I took my brother's hoodie and then, you know, would like wear that around for like the next year. <laughs> this is before, you know, like internet immediate gratification moving on. So it had time to marinate. And then, um, you know, it would go from like Elliot and E.T. to my mom made me a Robin costume one year and I wore that for a year. And um, so it just, you know, it was, for me, it was just a way of accessing my imagination and making sense of the world around me and making sense of the way I saw the world around me. And I was like, oh God, thank God. Thank God I'm not the only person who ever just sat on a swing for two hours imagining what if there was a movie about this. I mean, I was in a swing too, singing along to the Bessel Horace in Texas songs. Were you really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, making up my own. Nice. Hard Candy Christmas, that was one of my big ones. Nice, man. Yeah. <laughs> We're both from Texas. We're both from outside Houston. So. It's in the water. 
It's in the water. <laughs> um, well, since we have a room full of actors, yeah. do you have any... What is the one piece of advice that you wish that you had known when you were starting out? Oh my God, that's so subjective. Um, and so different for everyone's process and what they want to do. But I wish, you know, I think I was talking with an actor um, on set, I think yesterday or the day before. And she was like, I wish I'd known that you can just do it. I wish I'd known you can just create opportunities for yourself and just do it. This was somebody who went to Georgetown and got like a degree in economics or something and then decided to become an actor because she thought she couldn't just do it. And we're given so many opportunities in this day and age. You know, the internet comes with many things, but one of the great things it comes with is this great opportunity to create your own opportunities and, and, and your own possibilities and, and put your work out there in new ways. And we have more venues now than ever to just do it, to make things happen. And um, I think that's one thing I want to remember going forward. I, I, I want to, there's a short film I wrote a long time ago. I'm like, I'm just going to do it. Because if I just talk about it, I'll, it'll just never happen. So I'm going to create these opportunities and just do them. So I think that's, I guess that's the best advice I can give. <laughs> and you were talking about someone who did not go to theater school yeah. or drama school, but you went to Carnegie Mellon. Is oh, no, I had a PowerPoint presentation for my parents at like 16 <laughs> as to how I was going to escape Spring, Texas and go to drama school. I just grabbed a bindle and threw it over my shoulder and hit the road. Good for you. Yeah, thanks. I was not that courageous. I needed a backup plan. No, I had, um, I, you know, I played football in, in, in high school, and then my senior year I kind of left to start working at the Alley Theater in Houston. And we were lucky enough. I mean, the reason I read The Normal Heart at 14 is because we had this kind of insane but brilliant director and teacher who came in and out of our high school who brought every play that was going on on and off Broadway. So at 14 years old, I was doing scenes from The Normal Heart and The Destiny of Me and Angels in America. I mean, people thought I was batshit crazy. In Spring, Texas, they were like, um, can you do Greater Tuna? I was like, um, no, I'm going to do the Harper and Joe scene or whatever it was from <laughs> Angels in America. <laughs> um, so, you know, he opened so many doors just in terms of understanding what was going on out there. And um, we had this wild public school program that was so committed that I, I think at one time there were like four or five kids from my public high school in Spring, Texas at Juilliard at the same time. And so I knew how to audition for schools and what to do and how to get an NFAA. I mean, I think I got like a hundred dollar scholarship or something, which covered like two meals at Carnegie Mellon. But um, still, it was an opportunity, and, and I, it was something they taught me about, and they knew how to get financial aid and things like that. And so um, uh, my dad, God bless him, who was you know a former football player who works in the shipping industry, was like all right, I'll take my son to New York City and we'll audition for these drama schools. <laughs> and he stood by me and waited for me out there while I went in and did my monologue from Henry IV, Part One, <laughs> and Lonely Planet by Stephen Dietz. And, you know, thankfully, Carnegie Mellon let me in and, and that brought me to New York. Do you still use, what do you use most from that training? Oh man, I wish I used more. I we you know it, it's it was so condensed um, at that school. I mean, it was like it was a great preparation for being on a television show actually because we would work eighty hours a week on all the material and classes we had. It was it was a lot, um, but uh, I think it, it depends on the job. You know, if I'm on stage, I use the Linklater training the most to, to be able to sustain eight performances a week. If I'm on camera, it might be something more Alexander-based or, you know, as I sit like this right now, I'm going to just... <laughs> um, you know, it just depends. Um, and and it, for me, you know, I had read Boleslavsky and I'd read, um, you know, An Actor Prepares and becoming a character and creating a role and all those things before I got to drama school because of that crazy teacher. 
And, um, but it really gave me um, this, and there's a man named Larry Moss who works here in New York, who I work with, who gave me some sense of how to just break down a scene and no matter what the scene is and what the role is, how to you know, really make sense of it. And I still do that um, every day before I go to work. Uh, even in season six of White Collar, they're, they're essential questions you ask and a way to break down the scene. So it was sort of technique, I guess. And then how did you do, you prepare a lot. Do you do a condensed version of that for auditions? Yes. So, yeah. you know, wow. So you're doing the whole, the breakdown and yeah. coming in with everything. I mean, I'm not going to write up like a 20 page character <laughs> history if I get the <laughs> script the night before. Yeah. But I definitely put as much thought as I'm. Um, do you guys know Larry Moss? Do you know who he is? He's amazing. And he has a great book on acting. And in the back is a list of like 22 essential questions for breaking down a scene. And it's really, you know, it can be time consuming. But if you do that, you have your bearings about you. And you can have, you might not look right for the role. You might have something that they don't see is right. But you can have any creative dialogue with somebody in an audition in that circumstance. You might not be 40 and British. Yes, but you can figure out how to dig a little deeper, I guess. <laughs> do you have any audition rituals that you do? Do I have any audition rituals? No, I mean, you know, the best auditions, there's so many X factors that happen in auditions. I try to always just think that whatever's meant to be is gonna happen. Um, and have, as long as I feel like I've brought my best work to the table, I can walk away and go, oh, if I don't get it, I don't get it. And, and I, I, I think I've even gotten that way to if it's a big movie and I, that happens, I'm like, okay, well, it wasn't meant to be. Um, but there are so many. I remember one time I was testing for a pilot that I thought was going to be huge and such a big opportunity, and the casting director's phone went off right in the middle of my audition. And it was not on vibrate, y'all. It was like, so I was like, do I acknowledge this? And it was like in the middle of a big monologue my character had. And I don't know, you know, when you test, it's like a room full of executives and you. And so I didn't know, should I break this up? What do I do? And there are just things that happen. Um, I kept going with the scene. I'm not sure if that was the best choice or not, because I think in my mind I was like, this will show them that no matter how many distractions I have on set, I can still keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just, you know, I, I just try to do, do the work I can do in the time I have. I always like having more time than less, which we're not always provided that luxury. But if I have material for a week, I feel that I can let go of all the technical aspects of things and kind of get lost in the scene. And that to me is when the most interesting work happens anyway. And so, um... You know, I always like it if I have a little bit more time. But I don't like, you know, spin around three times and, you know, <laughs> I don't. You don't wear the same shirt to every audition. No. <laughs> every casting director just knows you no. from the one shirt. <laughs> no. Uh, what is your worst audition story that you don't mind sharing publicly? Didn't I just do it? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if I have a worse one than that. Um... I don't think of them as, you know, worse or worst or best or um, I think of them as really funny <laughs> or like something really crazy happened or I think that's kind of the fun part of the gypsy life that we get to lead is like, who are we going to fucking meet in this room today? Because whoever it is is probably as crazy as I am and a creative and like, let's just see what this is all about. So to me, that's kind of part of the fun of it. Um, so... I don't know. I, I remember having, um, uh, I guess it was a screen test. That's how it was labeled, but it didn't, it was just like, you know, a video camera on me with one hot light in my face um, <laughs> with um, an actress who was one of my all time favorites growing up. Um, oh, Jack Nicholson is one of my favorites too. Um, who, uh, one of my all time favorites growing up, this actress, and I was like, this is going to be my chance to act with this actress. Like, I, I never thought this would happen for me. This is amazing. This is gonna be unforgettable. And we, <laughs> we start the scene, and it was good material. 
And she was like, oh, I don't like this light. And she wasn't on camera. <laughs> I was. <laughs> and the whole thing came about, like, was her hair right? And, the, you know, and I was like, oh. Um, <laughs> bummer. Um, but, you know, things like that, for me, I, I don't think of it as best or worst. I'm like, oh, cool. So they're human, too. And things like this kind of level the playing field. And it teaches you to not have these kinds of crazy expectations when you meet these other artists that you get to work with because they're just as human and flawed as we all are and you know they're just trying to do the best with what they can on that day. So do you like auditioning? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Um, I'm not gonna say I, <laughs> um, I just, I'm not, I, I'm not as good of an auditioner as I am at work. There's something about knowing I've been entrusted with the role and knowing I've been given the vote of confidence to be there on set and having had the time with the material to do the work I want to do on it that makes the process so much more enjoyable to me. Whereas, you know, sometimes you come in and you're number 32 of 73 that day and, you know, the woman's not really looking at you or whoever. It could be a man. I don't mean to be misogynistic. And... <laughs> You know, they're kind of not really reading and they skip a line and you're waiting for them. You know, it's so I, there's so many things that are kind of left to chance. And I just and you feel like you're being thin sliced. And I so much of what's fun about acting for me is not about how you're thin sliced. It's what you, about what you have deeper down and what you have to offer that comes from your guts. And you're not always really given the opportunity to do that in auditions. What else is fun about acting for you? Uh, it's interesting. I, I, I think initially for me it was about escape and giving voice to the characters in my head. Sitting I, on that swing. Yeah, and I think I found it in like sixth or seventh grade and I would, um, we had this teacher in middle school who would, we'd do these like humorous pieces and I would, I would have like 12 different characters in these pieces and I would sit up in my room for hours and just make different voices and f crazy faces. This is back when Jim Carrey was big, so <laughs> nothing was too big for me. And just make up these crazy, and it just, for me, it was such an outlet that, you know, my family's amazing, but nobody understood. <laughs> I remember one time I decided to give them a full out performance of Born in the USA <laughs> as Bruce as the boss, and they lasted like half of one verse, and they were like, okay, um, we're gonna go back and eat dinner now. Keep that in your room. Um, so I don't know, for me it was about that initially, but I think one of the, one of the joys of, of getting to do it for a while and, and grow up in the business a little bit is just getting to start to access more of yourself and, and bring more of yourself to jobs and learn more about who you are and, and what you have to bring to specific parts as opposed to trying to affect something, you know? Well, you're still doing that thing you did on the swing. You rented a stage to do the normal heart. Yeah. Yeah. And just brought it all to life with all of your <laughs> yeah. Jim Carrey faces now I'm picturing, <laughs> which is an amazing visual. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're out of time, but I want to ask, because we've talked a lot about theater yeah. and theater training, are you looking to come to Broadway anytime soon? Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to be Broadway. Uh, it could be off-Broadway. It could be off-off-Broadway. It could be whatever. I, it's just about being the right piece. I've had, I've had a couple opportunities to do... <clears throat> Broadway shows, which I think will be great, amazing shows, but I, you know, I, for me, theater is so integral in, 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 in uh, being a social dialogue. I mean, some, some pieces are really just sheerly for entertainment, but it has so much to say about who we are and where we're going and where we've been, and so to just revive a piece to make money for an estate or something like that, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So if the right thing really comes along, um, there's a piece that I'd really like to do at Williamstown next year. Uh, and I have sort of a creative vision for it. Um, and I'd like to do that. And then if that goes really well, maybe move it to New York or something. What is it, could you tell us? Uh, Orpheus Descending. Nice. Yeah, it's one of my all-time faves. And I think there are some interesting ways to um, do a really unique production of it.
Yeah. No, that's a good one. Yeah. You're not resting on your laurels. You're taking not on yet. difficult Tennessee Williams. <laughs> yeah. No, Val is a really challenging character, and that's why, you know, it's really, the show is really about Lady. It's really yeah. her and Carol Cotrillo, really. So Val is sort of just the guy who enables them, but I think, I just love that whole story, and I love the Orpheus and Eurydice myth. That's so fascinating to me, because I was one of those people who, when I first got into relationships, I was like, I'm going to reach down and save you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I don't <laughs> Um, life's too, life is too fucking short. Um, <clears throat> so, I don't know. I want to channel that into this piece and, and um, you know, <laughs> it could be fun. <laughs> we'll keep an eye out, guys. Next year, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, and that's it. That's all we have time for awesome, tonight. Matt. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. Thank you, Matt Bomer, for joining us. I really appreciate your time and coming out in this humidity and being here and and watching this film, and um, I just, you know, if you have friends who haven't seen it, please please share it, because um, it's something that we all really poured our hearts and souls into, and I'm, I'm thankful that you came out tonight. All thank right, you. thank you. <laughs>